Good morning. Welcome to Mornings with Me. I've got a new mug. I eat books for breakfast from a library fundraiser. And happy Father's Day. This is in memory of my father who introduced me to a lot of things. I am uh, linking to a live journal post I did about my dad. But just for the video, I'm going to talk about three authors I know from my dad um, that I wouldn't, well, I might have uh, run into them later, but he introduced them to me when I was a kid. So the first one I want to talk about is Douglas Hofstadter. Um, this is not his most famous book, Men of Mag Magical Themas, which I'll talk about in a moment. It's the most famous book that won the Pulitzer Prize, I think in 1981, I'd have to look it up, but early 80s, uh, called Gerda Lescher Bach. And it really builds up uh, idea of isomorphism, recursion. It's kind of complicated, but it's all to get you to the point where you can understand to a certain extent uh, Gödel's incompleteness incomple theorem. Uh, there had been a grand project to prove all of math. Okay, maybe not that, but to show that it could be done, that you could have a complete system that was logically consistent, and Gödel showed you couldn't. Uh, Escher, of course, M.C. Escher is the famous artist with all of the tilings and a lot of self-referential pictures. And then Bach uh, is uh, Johann Sebastian Bach, and he had all sorts of interesting mathematical structures in his music as well. Those aren't the only things that appear in that book. There's uh, discussions of artificial intelligence, uh, various other computer science concepts, and there's a lot of wordplay. So what uh, how this happened was it was around 1982. My father had gone to New York City for a three-month um, training with IBM, where, uh, who he worked for, uh, for management. And I think he picked up the book around then. Um, and a few years later, he handed it to me. I was probably about 12 years old at the time when he did hand it to me and said, uh, you know, Mary Pat, you'll love it. It's too theoretical for me. And I've just got to say, it's not all that the theoretical. Um, he has a lot of examples, but really what captured me were these dialogues that they had in between the chapters. Because at a certain point, and it was very quickly, I ran into not being able to understand the chapters. But I could understand the dialogues, and they're very interesting. Um, and I kept coming back to that book over and over again. Part of the reason I can't find my copy of the book, I did have or I do have somewhere, several copies, but the problem is I kept reading this book so much, um, at least two copies I've owned over the years have fallen apart because I read it so much. So what about this book? As I said, uh, Metamagical Themas. Uh, so Douglas Hofstadter wrote a column for the Scientific American for a while called Metamagical Themas, which was a play, it's an anagram of Mathematical Game, which was Martin Gardner's column, and I will be talking about that in a bit. And so he worked on a lot of the concepts in, let me see if I can get this well, and I'm not sure you can see this too well. I know YouTube's not going to be great for this. Uh, this one of the articles was on recursion and the programming language Lisp. Uh, these columns ran in the early 80s. The Lisp one, I'm just taking a look, uh, was from 1983. Uh, so I tried my hand at Lisp uh, because of Hofstadter. Here's something else, and again, this is what I was saying when I was reading Hofstadter. Originally, I didn't understand a lot of it, but because I did major in math, and so I got an undergraduate degree in math, I got a master's degree in math, and then I uh, dropped out of a PhD program in math, um, and he had a lot of stuff that was relevant to what I did. This is uh, a fixed point thing. So I, I don't want to explain how this works. I could probably give you a link. Uh, Nonlinear dynamics and strange attractors. Um, you may have heard of this from uh, James Glick's Chaos. Um, so this was from, I think, 1981. I'm just trying to find. Yeah, 1981. Um, so it's a lot of food for thought and you find yourself ruminating over it a lot. And sometimes it takes a while till you get it. Uh, but there's a lot of great ideas, and I remember one time when I was mm, probably about 14, just getting, reading the book, and then feeling paralyzed, sitting in my chair, like, oh my gosh, there's all of these electrons and quantum tunneling going on around me, how do I know 
where, where I end and the universe begins that I swear I wasn't smoking weed. Uh, anyway, uh, it, it provided a mystical experience. So I'm going to break a moment. Okay, I'm back. So here's my second author, Isaac Asimov, um, known for sci-fi, and that's actually what my father handed me first were the sci-fi books. Actually, I believe it was Caves of Steel was the first one um, he gave me. Uh, he had, Asimov has a lot of compilations of short stories and that's what By Jupiter is. And there's a lot of amusing things in here. Um, and then he also wrote a lot of nonfiction. Now my dad didn't hand me the nonfiction books. Uh, I did come across them later and a lot of times I didn't even realize they were by Isaac Asimov um, because it would be stuff like this is you know, kind of on um, chemistry and physics to a certain extent. He, he did have a doctorate in uh, chemistry. And what's uh, kind of funny is, I, I just want to read a, a passage towards the end of this book. Uh, some years ago, when his nephew Daniel Asimov was yet a student at MIT, Danny had occasion to write to Martin Gardner and point out a small error in Gardner's excellent mathematical recreations uh, Column. I'm sorry, it's Mathematical Recreations. Okay. In Scientific American, Gardner acknowledged the error and wrote me to tell me about it and ask a natural question. Am I correct in assuming, said he, that Daniel Asimov is your son? Well, as everyone knows who knows me, I'm only a little past 30 right now. I was only a little past 30 at the time, some years ago, when this was taking place. I therefore wrote a letter to Gardner and told him with some stiffness, I am not old enough, Martin, to have a son who is old enough to be going to MIT. Danny is the son of my younger brother. Anyway, um, yes, yeah, so the great thing about Asimov, he's got a lot of humor. Uh, the problem is I don't really recommend his nonfiction books. I mean, the science ones are good, uh, but the nonfiction books he writes when it's not science. Um, okay, he had a book on, I think it was called The Dark Ages. And that was actually one of the first books I read on the Dark Ages. Well, you know, it's decades later. I went back to that book a year or two ago, and I started noticing a lot of historical errors, even for the time. So when he's writing about the humanities or things outside of chemistry, physics, you know, that kind of thing, um, be aware and beware. Uh, his fiction, on the other hand, is a lot of fun. It's very ideas-driven, not really character-driven. And he does love wordplay. Um, he, he does write some super short stories sometimes where it's a single page, and then the end of the story is on the next page, and it's in service of a really, really bad pun. Um, it is actually kind of fun, and you can see it coming. In most of his compilations of his short stories, um, he might have intros and outros, I guess, uh, explaining the uh, context of the, the story. And so I do like this. There's one story here about Everest, about them giving up climbing Everest. It's like in 1952. Well, in the note at the end, because there's this is not a pun one, um, it says, let me explain the reason I frequently discuss Everest. Uh, this was uh, published a couple months before uh, Edmund Hillary and Tenzing Norgay actually got to the top of Everest. And it's like, man, my timing's not that great. Um, and, and I guess it was when he, oh, he had sold it, but it hadn't been published yet. So that's actually kind of um, funny. Uh, but he has a lot of really uh, classic sci-fi. The Foundation series I've talked about before, but Caves of Steel is also a good uh, entry point. It, or I, Robot, which are short stories kind of in a loose narrative about the development of the three laws of robotics. So, uh, Asimov. Okay, so for my final author, Martin Gardner. Um, this book I bought in 1993, so that was after my dad had died. Um, but um, I had a lot of Martin Gardner books, and he has a lot of books out uh, from the cheap paperback uh, publisher Dover book. Highly recommend them all. Uh, he wrote, um, and it really was mathematical games, uh, a column for Scientific, America, uh, Scientific American uh, for years. And um, 
it's what's great about Gardner. I swear, this man is responsible for more people becoming mathematicians, at least in the United States, I don't know about worldwide, than actually a mathematician. He wasn't a mathematician, which I didn't realize until I wrote him about a probability problem I was trying to solve, and I was asking him if he had come across something like that before, because he did write. Uh, some of his articles were about you know, certain kind of probability problems. And I want to tell you, you don't actually need to know a lot of math to approach his stuff. Um, for Douglas Hofstadter, you, you kind of do need to know a lot more. That's why I kept getting stuck. But pretty much everything Gardner wrote was very accessible, um, especially for the mathematical game. So here's, you know, here's something that's really cool. It's about different kinds of projections of maps that are kind of non-standard. Um, here's another one. I don't know if you've ever seen tangrams, and I see that I've, I've marked this up. So it's a particular dissection of a square, and this is often used in um, puzzles where you're given shapes that you need to reproduce using all, I believe it's seven, um, tangrams. And here's, evidently, this was a carved ivory tangram set that Edgar Allan Poe had. Hmm. Uh, anyway, um, so there's a lot of cool stuff, and I have a story, oh, i got to find this, about one particular um, page. So this ran in April 1975, called Six uh, Sensational Discoveries. This one is a counterexample to the Four Color Theorem, and before you start writing me emails, you need to read the blog post. Um, a, th um, a thought experiment that disproves special relativity. Mm -hmm. um, here we go. Da Vinci invented the flush toilet. Okay, got it. And uh, how, how to get a perpetual motion with a psychic motor. Okay. Uh, anyway, <laughs> so yeah, I've had this, I've had this uh, book for a while and while he called it recreational math, and just like the tangrams and stuff, there's actually a lot of very serious mathematics going on in these. Um, so this is a great place to start out. So here's one, the non-transitive paradoxes. You can do a set of dice, like say, die number one, die A, die B, die C. Six-sided, but they have different numbers on them. And you can have it set up so, you know, you roll the dice against each other and whoever rolls the higher number wins. Um, and you can have it so A always beats B, B always beats uh, C, and C always beats A. Hmm. Okay, so there's a lot of good stuff. And as I said, very accessible. And a lot of mathematicians were created by that. So I'm going to do a cheat, but I really want to um, plug this because it involves a, an actual mathematician. The annotated Alice. So Alice in Wonderland and Alice Through the Looking Glass. So that's by Lewis Carroll, who was Charles Dodgson, who really was a mathematician. But it's annotated by Martin Gardner. And I discovered, and you're going to see, I'm going to flip it over, <laughs> because I put the cover on upside down. No, uh, that was just a mistake. Uh, that wasn't on purpose. So what you see, I'll, I'll just give you an example. So here is, I think it's the Duchess um, with her baby that turns into a pig. And so you see the notes in uh, the in the margins. And it, it gives you some cultural stuff, but in some of the cases, it does involve, um, you know, the people that Lewis Carroll knew, but also um, some of the mathematics uh, that's going on. And there was mathematics. I'm sorry, there was mathematics going on um, in there. And it's a, just a beautiful book. And it gives you more understanding of a classic book. So those are my three authors. Um, highly recommend if you really want to know what real math is like, actually, Martin Gardner will give you a better idea than anybody else, not your school math. So just something to think about and hope to see y'all next week.